But bottom line, a hundred person, a hundred person organization will have somebody click on a phishing link within 30 days. That's the statistic or a bad link within 30 days. It may or may not have viable malware on it. It might get caught by the virus detector, but each one, when that machine is infected, it on average affects 22 other machines within seconds. Two hops later, 440. So within two hops, that machine, that single click has infected the entire organization. And there's a 75% chance that that small business will go out of business within 18 months. Welcome back, everyone, to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy, never normal shift going on all around us. Our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow and explore the ever changing convergence of people, business, and technology. Here is your host, Ira Wolf. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. I'm Ira Wolf. If you think this is just another podcast, think again. This is the voice of the most important conversations in the future of work, confronting business leaders and people today. Our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow and explore the ever-changing convergence of business, people, and technology. The conversation today is going to focus on navigating the future of cybersecurity in a work without borders world. And in just a few minutes, my friend and one of the top global thought leaders in the world on cybersecurity, Alex Sharp, is going to be joining me to talk about the risks and the opportunities organizations are facing when it comes to protecting their communications, information, intellectual property, brand, and their employees. And not without coincidence, today's show is brought to you by our good friends at Avanti. The way we work is changing, and it's up to IT and employees to make it happen. Avanti's at the forefront of making everywhere work work. In just a few weeks, Avanti is hosting the Avanti Solutions Summit in Grapevine, Texas. There'll be over 70 educational ses sessions and keynotes there. And what I'm most excited about is the release of their 2024 Everywhere Work Report. While there are plenty of surveys and polls about employee preferences on remote and hybrid work, no one does a better job at addressing the importance of digital employee experience in the workplace revolution than Avanti. Now, I'd love to share with you some of the results of that report today, but I can't quite yet. You'll have to wait a few weeks for that. But you could join me at the summit when the results are announced. Let's learn a little bit more about the Avanti Solutions Summit. Avanti Solutions Summit 2024 is just around the corner. Join us in April to shape the future of work together with Avanti. Learn more about this exciting event and register on the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization website. Use code SM Industry Partners. The, solution, the Avanti Solutions Summit is an excellent opportunity for you to learn and network with colleagues and thought leaders about how employees can work better from anywhere. You can learn more about it at geeksgeezersgoogleization.com or by visiting avanti.com. That's I-V-A-N-T-I dot com. And keep listening to Geek Skeezers and Googleization because I'll be sharing the results of Everywhere Work each week after the summit. It's hard to believe, but it's been four years since the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic and the world shut down. Employees were sent home and literally left to their own devices and know-how how to connect with work. While employees, employers focused on getting employees up to speed using Zoom, securing all those devices and mobile connections became a bit more challenging. Overnight, cybersecurity, re cybersecurity requirements were more than just antivirus software. Simply put, it was a lot easier to train workers how to use Zoom than, be, than to become competent IT and cybersecurity professionals in the world we live in. Well, here we are four years later, and the risks are exponentially greater. The transition to remote and hybrid work is still a work in progress. Are the, or, 
are ex organizations keeping up? That's easy to say. Are, or, or are organizations keeping up? Are employee devices protected and safe? Or are they just sources of risk and vulnerability? Today, my guest, Alex Sharp, is joining me to help answer some of those questions. Alex is a Thinkers 360 top five global thought leader in cybersecurity with more than 30 years experience in cybersecurity governance and digital transformation. He has spent much of his career helping corporations and government agencies create value while mitigating cyber risk. He offers a pra pragmatic understanding of the delicate balance between business realities, cybersecurity, and operational effectiveness. Let's welcome Alex Sharp to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. Great to see you. Hey, thanks for having me, Ira. That was uh, this is a pretty exciting introduction. Thank you. That that conference sounds like a blast. Yeah, we're, I'm look, really looking forward to it. I've worked with Avanti for the last um, probably almost three years, ever since they released the uh, first uh, Everywhere Work report. And uh, it's usually filled with some some great data. And then I think it summarizes it pretty well. But we're here to talk with you and, and help uh, look at cybersecurity in, in uh, 2024 and beyond. And uh, you've been in the business a long time. But let's start with one of my the questions is, how did you get interested in this? Where, you know, when you were a young kid, did you say, hey, I'm going to grow up and become a cybersecurity thought leader? Um. Oh, boy. Um, to be honest, in many ways, I'm really not sure. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you how it happened. Um, it's it's one of those things. Now, I've often joked that my my career has been a series of unanticipated phone calls. And this is kind of like that. So I'm a bit of a geek. Um, my bachelor's is in electrical engineering with a concentration in computer engineering. And then I picked up minors in computer science and math. And you really don't get much geekier than that. I love statistics. I had a fascination with things like cryptography and history and national security and all this. And um, I, you know, I could, I could say this now, but I couldn't only a few years ago. Um, when it came time to graduate and looking for a job, I was interested in some of the things I saw from the intelligence community. And, and even before I could sign up for an interview with uh, National Security Agency, who, you know, the U.S. government didn't even admit their official existence at the time, they reached out to me for a job interview. And long story short, I took a, I took a position with them and then was recruited into an internal internship program around information security, which we now call cyber. And I, I just grooved on it. I just grooved on it. And so it was really, it just kind of happened. And to kind of round out the story a little, this work where it gets a little, little funny, or it gets funnier, I should say, after doing that for a bunch of years, I'm looking at it going, you know, security is always an afterthought and all this. And, you know, I, I went to work for a couple of large uh, consulting firms, Booz Allen and KPMG. And during that time, I transitioned away from cyber being 100 percent of the business to probably being around 20 to 40 percent of what I was doing. I was getting involved more in business strategy and uh, process improvement and the like, you know, what we now call digital transformation. And then about a handful of years ago, totally by my surprise, um, that's reversed where today my work is almost exclusively uh, involves cyber, even if it's a digital transformation project right now, it's mainstream. And coincidentally, a lot of the things I was dealing with when I first started, like artificial intelligence and quantum computing and what we now call blockchain, um, you know, it's all come back. It's, it's really, it's really a very weird arc. It, yeah, it, it is. It, it's, yeah, it certainly is. Uh, so let, let's dig into a little bit, and, and I like the the 
kind of your journey um, because you talked about you know cyber or information security, then cybersecurity, uh, and 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 then also um, you know brought in all these other modalities mm -hmm. or, or new technologies that are coming in, digital transformation. But it, it seemed that if we look back, and it's hard to believe, it's four years ago this month. Um, that we were all in, in lockdown, we were all in quarantine, and, and uh, literally, every some people literally went home with all they had was maybe they had a laptop, maybe they didn't, um, and they might have had their mobile phone, and that's how they were connecting, you know, with people. So it 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 seemed that that all the infrastructure that was set up, all the you know whether it was done well or even you know moderately well. Um, all the infrastructure that was set up of people going to work, that the whole cybersecurity system kind of, there were holes opened up. People were at home and and many of them didn't even know how to get on the Zoom yet set up proper protocols to, to make sure their wireless networks were secure. So let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, what, what have you seen between March 2020 and March 2024 in how companies are addressing this remote hybrid work revolution? Yeah, so that is something I speak about all the time. I've done a, a bunch of presentations about it, uh, you know, some conferences, some papers and all. It it's, it's pretty interesting in a lot of respects, and I won't take up too much time, but the, the, the thing that happened was, uh, let me start with the basics. So if you look at our security architectures, they're, they're outdated. They, they were formed at a time largely in the 70s and 80s when we could take all of our assets, put them in one place, and we could dictate how to get in and out digitally. And we surrounded it with walls and guards and badges and guns and sometimes dogs and barbed wire and sensors and we could protect it that way right and it assumed whether most security professionals didn't realize it the architectures were really assumed that people were coming to work every day so you didn't have to worry about these things like multi-factor authentication because one of the factors you were using was that they were physically in your building connecting to your network and that all changed overnight, right? And the statistics around that were pretty interesting. It turns out that prior to 2020, only one out of about every nine people actually worked remote at some level, you know, whether that be one day a month or, you know, a couple of days a week or 100%. And most of the time they were technologists or they were senior level executives, right? So they had a special thing going on. Then when COVID hit, um, we, we, it's called crossing the chasm. There's a lot of work done on this by uh, Jeffrey Moore. It's a very well understood thing that once you hit about 18% per, of adoption by a community, it, it becomes a de facto standard. So during COVID, most industries accelerated the digital adoption between five and 10 years. The biggest number I saw was actually healthcare adopting um, you know, digital health. Uh, that actually adopted more, it gained more adoption in six weeks than it did in the previous 11 years. Mm -hmm. it, it, these numbers are pretty sh shaking, right? And you know, four years later, we're still we're still struggling with that paradigm shift in part because a lot of the security professionals were not classically trained and we have a lot of people just jumping into the, into the fray. Right. Um, and they're trying to come up to speed. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of what we're dealing with was actually forecasted and um, mapped out in a um, effort called, um, I'm forgetting the name, Jericho, the Jericho Forum, because the walls came tumbling down. I always think that's the coolest name ever. That forum was over 20 years ago. 
And at the time, they thought the adoption and moving to things like the cloud was about 10 years away. They were only off by about 17 years. So, yeah. yeah. Minor miscalculation, right? Yeah. So you brought up a whole lot of things. And I think yeah. one, of the, one of the scary things is, is that, you know, certainly government and healthcare, uh, two of our largest employers and organizations and institutions that are out there, also with some of our most confidential and, and private information, uh, are, are two organizations that were really built around people coming to work. Oh, yeah. And all of a sudden, they're, they're remote. And, and, and again, and even in healthcare, although we have the, the uh, our first, our, our, not our, our providers uh, had to be present, uh, a lot of the staff was not. And, you know, we hear, you know, it's, it's almost commonplace now. It's almost become normal, um, unfortunately. Uh, about hearing about a hospital that's been um, that that has been held up for with ransomware, you know that their their systems are shut down. Yep. Um, you know, I'm surprised we 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 don't hear about it, but uh, you know, it's surprising that government uh, and I assume some governments that maybe state and local governments that's happened to as well. Uh, you know, maybe they just don't have the deep pockets that that healthcare does uh, in order to do that. Um, but you know, when you look at it, that scale that these large organizations that have devoted, um, you know, probably millions of dollars uh, into the architecture and the support and the staffing uh, to protect their systems, mm -hmm. and then we have at least, and the numbers vary, but at least fifty percent of people on an any on, uh, of employees on a, on every day are working remotely yep. and it may be their work even on the way to even even on the way to work they may be on a call on their mobile device um they're in a coffee shop they're mm -hmm. having lunch uh and then they come and even if they do come back to the office they're coming back to their office with their personal devices okay yep and, which, which doesn't and, and this is a huge question but what it's leading up to is that when we think about security, we're thinking, oh, I have antivirus on my desktop. Oh, yeah, I have it on my my laptop, but they may not have it on their tablet. They may not have it on their phone. And now we have all these smart devices. Oh, God, yes. Yeah, we have the smart devices. And and I know Avanti shared this story a couple of years ago of, of um, I believe it was a it was a freight. I, I believe it was a shipping company. And there, there was a vulnerability that they exposed and they found out, I can't remember, it was a toaster, like a smart toaster or some smart type of device in their cafeteria. Um, and they had, in every one of them, they had these remote controlled um, devices or these smart devices. So th the exposure is everywhere. Okay. And if we can't expect the institutions to be knowledgeable and the experts to be able to secure even their organizations, how can we expect a remote workplace to do it? All right. So uh, we just now like teed up the next three hours. Uh, there's there's a lot to unpack there. So let me hit a couple of critical points. If you look at historically how we've handled this cyber issue, what we now call cyber, um, we, we talked about the techies. It was a technology, you know, we kind of viewed it as a technology problem that should be solved by techies. Yeah, and well, we, even, and I spoke about this a lot with the remote work. When everybody went home, all of a sudden, every employer was expect, employee was expected to be their own IT department. Yeah. But when they showed up at work, the first thing that happened was um, they called IT. And sometimes it was simple of, did you, did you turn it on? <laughs> did you plug it in? Okay. Uh, and that... <laughs> Yeah, don't don't get me started. It's you know people complain about bots and the first person they talk to ask them silly questions. You would be surprised at the high percentage of people that call into a help desk and didn't turn it on or they didn't plug in the machine or you know something yeah, like. I wasn't that. being facetious. <laughs> no, you weren't. It, it really does happen. So, you know, if you if you call to a help desk and you get hit by a bot or somebody asking you fundamental questions, it, it's, you know, it's not you. It's it's because of all the other knuckleheads out there. Right. So 
yeah, a little bit of a commercial. So let's dive into what you talk about. So cyber historically, one of the big changes that happened, especially with COVID, is dig- the digital world, the cyber world, are 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 business discussions. More than sixty percent of revenue is driven by digital assets these days. Um, it turns out that intangible assets are uh, driving corporate valuations, right? So we're now talking about a business discussion. So now, and the adversaries, so we handled this historically with the techies. And the techies, because they're comfortable with technology, they implemented technical controls. Whether they realized it or not, they were assuming a physical presence, and they would put these, these technical defensive measures in place. And they're, they're very, very strong. They're actually the strongest part of our defense. Now, what's happened is we basically push, turn that towards the enemy and say, hit me here. And adversaries go, you know, that costs too much, takes too long, too much effort. I don't get a lot of reward. Why don't I just walk around the side? So if you look at what's going on, the major hacks have all been walking around the side edges of the brick wall. Um the most, what is it, 80 some odd percent of um, cyber incidents um, start with social engineering, 91% start with a phishing attack. Uh, my numbers might be a little off, but the magnitude is there, right? If you look at the major hacks that just happened with the casinos, those were social engineering attacks against the help desk. Right? All the technical defenses worked perfectly. It was the social engineering. So the world is starting to understand a couple of things. We're understanding that the people dimension, the process dimension, the organizational dimension are in many ways more important. If you look at the sheer numbers, the, the best investment you can make with the highest return on investment in any cyber investment is awareness and training. Uh, the numbers are staggering. The average person without any training will fail a phishing attack about half the time. With training that comes down, there's actually really good numbers based on industry, somewhere between three and 5%. And if you look at the volume, the volume is scary. We all get hit with spam. It turns out the service providers are actually blocking somewhere between 98 and 99 percent of the spam before it ever gets to us. That's scary. Looking at my spam, looking at my filter box. It's it's scary when you work when you work in this field, you you get to see kind of like the worst of everything. It's like if you ever if you ever know a police officer, they they see the worst of people all the time. Right. So they tend to view the world a little differently. It, it's what happens, right? Um, th- these numbers are scary. So it, it's really, we're recognizing that. The second thing we're recognizing is incidents will happen. So we need to detect them faster. We need to recover them quicker, right? So we're moving away from sole reliance on technical defenses to understanding the other components of people, process, and organization, we're also realizing that we, you know, incidents are going to happen. Just like when you get in your car every day, you acknowledge that you may or may not be in a in a in a car accident, right? It's one of the reasons we get insurance. If we didn't think there would ever be, ins- you know, if there was ever a risk to it, we would get the bare minimum required by the state. We would get nothing else, right? It's like everything else. Um, if you look at statistically, um, the most dangerous place to be. Uh, is your home, but I don't think that keeps anybody from going home at night, right? right? Same sort of thing. We recognize incidents happen, so we're prepared for it. You keep Band-Aids around the house for a reason. Nobody walks out any given day and say, I'm, I think I'm going to get a cut today, right? You have Band-Aids accepting that it might happen. And that's the way the world is moving. Um, a lot of ways it's not moving as fast as I would like, uh, but I've you know, been doing this way too long and have been beating, you know, myself and a lot of others who've been here for a very long time have been beating that drum for a very long time. So we'd like to see it move faster. But in many ways, 
um, COVID did us a major favor. It's just the transition hurts. So what? where do we start? Um, so we, we've got employers that need to be doing diff- things differently. We have employees who need to be, and, and I'd say work, workers in general, because there's a lot of gig workers and, and yep. things that, that need to do differently. And then I also want, want to leave at least a few minutes, and this is probably another three-hour show, um, to talk about things like TikTok and AI. I mean, is Ooh. is is that just going to blow this, you know, all open? Um, you know, while TikTok is a problem, it it does it. It sounds like it's more of the vulnerability problem than TikTok itself, because we use a lot of other devices, and and it gets we, we we can get in that whole debate: is is TikTok any worse than Facebook, or is Facebook worse than TikTok? Um, but but there's a lot of there's a lot of things going on. I mean, we talked about the smart devices, but we've got Things like TikTok and social media. Uh, so uh, let, let's start with, before we go down multiple rabbit holes, let's start with what, before we take a break, what can employ, what should employee, employers be doing um, to mitigate the risk or, and, and to not necessarily anticipate, but also to react better? What are, what are some of the things that you're recommending? All right, so let's let's touch upon the the TikTok and AI just very very briefly, and I I agree we should have another another show on it. Um, this is an area I'm actively involved with. What I will say is the thing that makes TikTok worse than all the others is TikTok is tr- is controlled by a foreign adversary who wants to do us harm. Right, that's the that's the key difference. The type of harm they want to do is significantly worse than we are seeing out of Facebooks and you know all the others, right? I I will look. I have a very strong background in national security. I have access to information a lot of other people don't. Um, I I tell people all the time to stay away from TikTok. I've been telling them that for years, and I've actually had some um I, I have relationships with people over there and the insiders will tell you stay away from TikTok as well uh the best thing that can happen is it could be brought it could be retained but brought under control of a, of a friendly nation a friendly country you know another company inside the us so with that aside the what does a business do really depends on the size of the organization and the nature of their business. So I'm going to presume for a second, based on our conversations, we're talking about privately held smaller organizations, right? Good assumption. Yeah, thank you. Because we we talked about this before, right? The, The absolute best thing to do is awareness and training for the staff. Now, there are different resources available. A lot of it depends on um, where you're located, what's offered by your state. Um, Frankly, this is an area that I think needs, it needs, it needs to be a lot cleaner and a lot a lot smarter. Um, there, there seems to be some agreement and movement on that space. I, I just don't think it's it's moving as fast as 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 I would like. I would mandate all employees implement multi-factor multi-factor authentication on anything they do, whether at home, at work at school, wherever. And, and just to make sure, because not, you know, the, the title of the show is Geek Skeezers and Googleization. So we have some geeks and we have some geezers. So for the, for the geek, and, and the geezers could be young, you know, it, it has nothing to do with age. It has to do with how you use technology. Um, is when you talk about multi-factor, you're talking about when you go to sign in, you may get a text. Yep. Or something to confirm that it's actually you. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I, I, 
do that at home in personal. Yeah. Um, it's annoying, by the way, th- it, to do it, but it it definitely it, it's a it, good it, practice. <laughs> it is annoying. Um, I, I well, at this point, a month doesn't go by that I get I don't get a call from somebody who had their credit card abused or money transferred out of their account, checkbook stolen. Um, last week, I'm not going to name the person because um, they are a senior person in the cyber industry. Their mother's Facebook account was hacked without them knowing it, and it redirected their Social Security payments. Mm-hmm. And I, I asked them, I, I, I'm sorry to hear that, but you know, weren't there three letters you should have shared with your mom, MFA, you know, and she's like, just, this is embarrassing, you know, so use it. I know it's a headache, but you know what? Mm-hmm. It's a bigger headache to chase this stuff down. Um, the good news is it, it used to be one or more times a week. I would get a call about it from somebody now it's probably once a month. Do yourself a favor. It's a pain in the tookish, but you know what? So are stop signs and red lights. You know, it's better than the alternative. I would much rather wait at a red light for three minutes than have to deal with, um, you know, recovering from an accident or getting, you know, replacing my car and, and all that. It's, it's, it's worth the, the inconvenience. And yeah, truthfully, absolutely. most most things that help us in life are inconvenient. Um, okay. okay, we're going to take a short break, um, and we're going to continue the conversation. Uh, the MFA the, uh, multi-factor authentication, um, absolutely phenomenal recommendation suggestion. Encourage everybody to do it. Um, but we're going to take a short break. Uh, we're talking with Alex Sharp. We're talking about navigating the future of cybersecurity in a everywhere work world. Uh, And we want to thank Avanti uh, for being a sponsor of this episode, which is at the forefront of everywhere work and the digital employee experience. Uh, If you haven't uh, heard about it, uh, there's a summit coming up in just a few weeks. You go to Avanti uh, Solution Summit. Uh, You can check that out at geekskeezergoogleization.com or avanti.com. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back uh, with Alex Sharp. Are your employees feeling stuck and just showing up for a paycheck? Is your workforce working harder to get back to normal than adapting to the future? It's time to help them break their addiction to certainty and develop a growth mindset. Developed by one of the world's top-rated future of work thought leaders, AQ Plus Mindset is a powerful tool to help your employees embrace change, adapt faster, and grow on the job. Conveniently delivered to any smartphone or laptop and easy to digest 5 to 10 minute lessons. Managers can sit back and watch employee attitudes shift towards growth and innovation in just 30 days. Are you ready to help your employees thrive in this ever-changing, never-normal world? Encourage them to show more grit, resilience, adaptability, and unlock their potential? The journey to a growth-filled future starts with a growth mindset. Visit aqplusmindset.com or call 484-373-4300. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to Geek Skeezers of Googleization. We're here today with Alex Sharp, one of the global thought leaders, a world's global thought leaders on uh, cybersecurity. Uh, we, when we left off, we were talking about some of the first steps that someone can do, and one from employer side was looking at uh, basically awareness training. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just training employees on on how to protect themselves and and the devices and. And, you know, part of that is that it is partly the employee or the in- individual responsibility. It, it can't, there is nothing in, in the world, and I assume I'm right with this, Alex, that there is no, there's no perfect protection that employers can put up that employees can just walk into and ignore. And yep. It's just not that simple. It take, it's a participative exercise. It's an activity. It's a team sport uh, to make this work. Um, and, and then, you know, certainly one of, the, one of the things that everybody should be doing is using the multi-factor authentication. And that's, 
you know, we're, we're simply, you, you, um, there's a number of tools that you can use and most, many of the sites actually ask if you want to set that up. And it simply is when you log in, somebody sends you an email or a text or any, uh, you know, a different type of notification, just verify it's you. It, it is, you know, it, it can be annoying, but it's less annoying than trying to track down uh, who hacked your site, um, getting, changing all your credit cards, losing money in your checking account and so forth. Uh, where else, where else do we go with that? What, what's the next step? I mean, we're, we're dealing in this world. We talked about TikTok a little bit. We talked about AI, but this isn't going to get, this isn't going away. It's not like we're waiting for this magic bullet that's going to fix this because with, with, just with AI is that the smarter we get, the smarter the adversaries get. Yeah. And let's kind of round out, let's definitely go back to that, but let's round out a couple of little hints and tips that a smaller business can put in place fairly quickly or things they can tell their their people to, to do. Um, if you look at the major banks, and I'm not going to list them because I think that would be inappropriate for a show, but if you look at the, the major banks, the systemically important banks, every one of them has put out training to their customers, Right. Some of them do a self-assessment on the score of what you're doing. Do that. Just do it and take those practices back to work. It sounds silly, but it's a very simple thing. The other one is if you look at the most of what happens to small businesses and individuals, it's really around the social engineering we talked about. And the techniques that these that's being used for social engineering are actually well understood by uh, marketing professionals, right? There's there's seven techniques that are used to prompt a sale. So the ones that are most relevant, if if you get a call from a customer or somebody pretending to be a fellow employee or um, an email out of nowhere that is trying to push you on something that's time sensitive or urgent, or it's really tugging at your emotional heartstrings, it's probably fake, okay? Another one is don't click any link or any attachment that you isn't absolutely from somebody you know that you were expecting, right? And if it looks a little funny, get somebody else to look at it. Right. That, that's a very basic thing. The other thing for small businesses, more than likely, you're relying on a third party for um, providing your IT support, whether it be anything from, you know, keeping our laptops alive to Internet connections to um, providing some level of cloud service. Unfortunately, they're all over the map. Right. There is no regulatory or licensing standard. Um, for, for those providers. Now, the Federal Trade Commission is looking at actually putting that in place, but that's not, you know, government moves slow, right? Big ship, lots of small rudders. It's going to take a while. So what I would do is presuming, you know, these people have their basics in place, I would make sure that they have like your antivirus software installed and updated on all the machines. It's designed to, you know, run automatic automatically. Also, um, you want to make sure that the machines are the machines and applications are being patched regularly. And if there is something critical coming out that they're watching all the vulnerability announcements and all the, uh, I don't want to go through the technical details. There's there's actually a, a bunch of databases that track this stuff and send out alerts. They should be monitoring that and feeding it back to you. And as part of your, whatever you're paying them, that's something they should be providing, right? So those are, those are things I would definitely put in there. On the AI side, uh, deep fakes are a huge problem. And that's much larger discussion than we have now. Um, you watch the news, you can see how big of a problem is. It will escalate as we get to the election. I, 
I have no doubt that's going to happen. What we're seeing on, and I did an article about this about a year ago, when ChatGPT came out, suddenly AI went mainstream. And one of the things we saw on the dark web was a lot of forums about how to use AI in a cyber attack. There was an increase of about 170%. So almost doubled overnight um, in, in, in phishing attacks because they could just automate them with like chat GPT, literally with chat GPT. And the efficacy rate, the efficiency rate on those attacks increased by something like 40 to 60%. They just went like this all of a sudden. It, it's, it's downright amazing. Um, I saw some stuff recently. I, I don't track the dark web. I track people that track it. Uh, but interestingly enough, all the problems that the rest of us are having with these tools like hallucinations, um, they're having them too. But the difference is we have, we have to deal with something called the defender's dilemma. The attacker has the advantage because defenders have to plug all the holes. The attacker only has to find one. So a lot of time with this volume, like we talked about the vast amount of spam, they can shoot out tons and tons of these generated messages only needing to find one person in one organization. Here's some statistics for you. Take a large organization. If 1% clicks on a link they shouldn't of, you know, pick, pick the size of the organization. But bottom line, 100% person organization will have somebody click on a phishing link within 30 days. That's the statistic. Or a bad link within 30 days. It may or may not have viable malware on it. It might get caught by the virus detector. But each one, when that machine is infected, it on average affects 22 other machines within seconds. Two hops later, 440. So within two hops, that machine, that single click has infected the entire organization, and there's a 75% chance that that small business will go out of business within 18 months if it's a ransomware attack. Scary, huh? That's why you want to ensure you have like the virus protection on your machines. You want to ensure that whoever you're relying on for IT support is patching the applications because these phishing attacks more than likely go after some known vulnerability that has been patched through a software update. And you also want to get your people to understand not to click on these things, right? To just be a little suspicious. Yeah, great advice. Uh, we are coming up toward the end of the show, unfortunately, because we're, we always seem to do this with all the guests. We sort of get into these deep topics and it's like, okay, now we got everybody's attention and now we're going to call it quits. So definitely want to have you back, uh, especially and definitely take you up on the on the TikTok, social media, AI conversation and, and follow up with that. Um, but one of the questions I always like to end with is, is there something I should have asked you, but I didn't? Um, you know, we touched upon all the big things. Maybe the question we should, we should talk about is if we're dealing with all this stuff from nation states, how do I, as a small business, fight that, right? What's the U.S. government and what are our allies doing to help defend us? Is there a succinct answer you can give for that now that you asked that we should have asked you that question? Um, yeah. And let's tease it for another another show. So there's a couple of things um, without going through too much history. The U.S. government has been working on this very aggressively, actually made changes to the State Department, Homeland Security and all. So we could bring the full force of the U.S. government to bear, whether that be diplomatic or it be financial, um, it be kinetic response. So far, we have not done a kinetic response deal. Two countries have, Israel and Ukraine, have responded kinetically, which is a way of saying warfare because of a cyber attack. 
But there's also a little known part of the US government called US Cyber Command. It's the offensive cyber arm of, of the US. It's the only party of the United States government that is authorized to actually have offensive cyber operations against foreign nations. So you may have seen in the news that there was this suspected um, Iranian intelligence ship that was, was disabled through a cyber attack. We'll never admit it, but it was more than likely done by US Cyber Command. Cool stuff, right out of the- Right, right out of the movies. <laughs> Right out of Hollywood, right? <laughs> the, the scary thing is, it's all it's all real. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, a lot, a lot of the stories from Hollywood are already are, it, it's already out there. They're, yep. they're just not yep. public. Yeah, and we could talk about that too, about yeah. uh, you know the evolution, the evolution, innovation, and the the role that the movies play. Yeah. Real quickly, want to do our one of the favorite parts of the show, uh, lightning round. It gets it's to get out to know Alex a little bit better. Um, so for a question, uh, who's your favorite band or favorite musician? Oh, the who? Oh, any, any fans? I'm sorry. Any, any favorite songs? Uh, pinball wizard. Yeah. You know, thank you for the two softballs. <laughs> Next question. If you were a car, this is a fun one. If you were a car, what kind of car would you be or a vehicle? A car or a vehicle, what kind would I be? The first thing that comes to mind is a Porsche, but I, I couldn't, uh, other than saying it's the first thing that comes to mind, I'd have to, I'd have to think about that. I'd have to think about that. It would probably be um, one of the movie cars. We'll, we'll bring it back. So you got a couple of weeks to think about that. Okay. Um, we are just running out of time here. I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for the uh, the fascinating conversation. Definitely going to have you back, Alex. We're going to get you on the calendar here uh, and continue this conversation uh, in um, hopefully within a few weeks or so. Uh, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? All right. So two, two things. Uh, I'm always on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a great way to connect, okay. right? Um, and, and it's Alex. It's Alex Sharp, and Sharp is with an E. S H A R P E. Right. Yes. And my my email. I think you already have it in the chat. We'll put that in the show notes. Uh, I'll make sure to get it there, and uh, you can go to Sharp Forty Two. Remember, Sharp has an E Forty Two dot com. Right. Yep. And you could you could Google me if you get Alex Sharp with an E on the end. Put any of the topics we have on here: cyber risk governance, cloud, you, you should find me. Um, if you come up with an Irish singer, that's not me. And if you come up with an 80-year-old economist from Harvard, that's not me either. So, Gotcha. So Alex Sharp, S-H-A-R-P-E, sharp42.com, and we'll put all that in the show notes. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, definitely going to have you back shortly. And thank everyone for listening for being part of Googleization Nation. Thank you for listening to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. Uh, thank you to Avanti for being the sponsor of this uh, of our show. Uh, and don't forget to look into the Avanti Solutions Summit that's coming up uh, beginning of April. Uh, you can learn more about that at avanti.com or geekskeezersgooglization.com. Uh, again, I want to thank Alex for being part of the show. Uh, and if you haven't subscribed to Geek Skeezers and Googleization on your favorite pod podcast platform or YouTube, please do so. Leave your comments, share a re review. And until next week, don't let the shift hit your plans. Thanks for watching Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization. Be sure to listen to the podcast and follow us on YouTube. This show was produced and edited by Hilton Productions.